Hey, this is Kotlin Conversations, where we're having conversations with just a few of the many great speakers and guests here at Kotlin Conf 2024. I'm Quintuet Dow, and I'm speaking with... Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Um, can you let us know, like, what do you do, and I guess your background with Kotlin? Yeah. So um, I'm working on a solver, an open source solver called TimeFault, mm -hmm. uh, and it solves uh, AI scheduling and planning problems. And uh, we support, we fully support Kotlin. So we have a number of quick starts and a few notebooks now in Kotlin. And uh, it's fun playing with those, and especially with the notebooks, to see the results immediately. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think we, I talked to someone else, and I was like, yeah, notebooks are just such a good, like, uh, as you said, instant, instant kind of gratification feedback. Um, so the reason I'm incredibly excited to talk to you, Jeffrey, is that um, I actually, so, so you mentioned scheduling, which, uh, isn't, I, I think for folks that aren't familiar with scheduling as a problem space, might be a little confused, like, oh, like Google Calendar, like my calendar or something, but no, actually not. Can you explain maybe more specifically, what is scheduling in terms of like a research, like problem solving space? So um, the whole world is actually full of planning problems, right? Okay. And scheduling problems. Yeah. So for example, um, when, you, when a company has to send out vehicles to go to a number of locations across the country, mm -hmm. that's actually a planning problem. And uh, the order in which you go to those locations can actually optimize or de-optimize your routes. If you do it with a single vehicle, it's called a traveling salesman problem. This is yeah. a very old... Yeah, very old. Yes, <laughs> I yes. think I learned about that in uni, yeah. And so they still haven't solved it, basically. You cannot still solve it optimally when it scales out and do that in reasonable time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we solve that kind of problems. Uh, we give you the best possible solution mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the amount of time you have available. Mm -hmm. But we actually do this not for one vehicle, but for multiple vehicles. Mm -hmm. where you can choose for each visit which vehicle you pick. Sim similar. Yeah. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And uh, similarly, we do other kinds of uh, scheduling problems. Like, for yeah. example, like assigning employees to shifts, right. or assigning maintenance jobs to times and to crews, mm -hmm. or uh, assigning uh, uh, job shop scheduling, where you need to assign machines that need to do certain jobs uh, to decide which job happens at which time. Mm -hmm. And all of these kinds of uh, planning problems, they have constraints, hard right. and soft constraints. Like mm -hmm. uh, you don't want, for example, for a vehicle to carry more than it can that it is, is allowed to carry. Uh, you don't want a, a person driving that vehicle have to have to work 12 hours. You, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to have overtime or you want to minimize overtime, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and that's hard when you don't want it and soft when you want to minimize it. And we put all of those constraints in, and then the, the solver just finds the best possible solution to do all that work, and typically does a much, much better job than humans can, basically. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think it, it's such an interesting way because you're taking real life problems and like abstracting them, right? So there's resources, there's like like kind of like a specific time, and you need to figure out how to best, you know, use up resources, use what resources you can, both time and like you know, I guess other resources. Yes. And is there, I, I'm really excited because I actually did do scheduling. Uh, research in uni, and it's so fascinating to me that it's all about optimization. As you said, uh, scheduling is an MP hard, for those of you who remember from uni, an MP hard problem. So it's not specifically finding the solution, but it's finding the most optimal solution within the given constraints that you have. Yeah. So I, I was like wondering with like Timefold, like how did that project start? Like when, when did it start? Like how did you kind of come, like how did you get started, yeah? So a very, very long time ago, 18 years, I started this in, um, in a summer break, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I was working somewhere where I saw some in, in these, of, of these algorithms, mm -hmm. and I figured I can do this better in a different way. And uh, after, it took me a decade to prove that, but anyway, um, so I worked on it in my spare time for a long time. Um, then by that time I worked for Red Hat. I worked at it for Red Hat for a long time. Yeah, yeah. The, the Red, and it, the project was called Octopreneur at that time. Mm -hmm. But then Red Hat got acquired by IBM and uh, the project no longer continued. So I started a company around it. And yeah. We're now one years old and we're called Timefold. And we're basically an open core company where the solver itself, which we're talking about here today and tomorrow, mm -hmm. is the open source thing. And on top of it, we uh, provide some services around it. So I think what's interesting is that, you know, like the, in terms of solving the problem, like there's like a lot of different approaches. So I think what I can say is that my research, for example, uh, when I was in uni was around genetic algorithms where we kind of parameterized the scheduling problem. And then we, allow, we, we basically populated a little simulation full of these different like, oh, here's a solution with like, you know, using this, this and that parameters. And here's another one. And they basically fight yeah. more or less. Uh, you kind of like, you know, uh, sorry, I forgot the 
correct terminology, but you basically, each one has like a certain score of like, you know, uh, success, and then you basically let them fight and figure out which one is the most successful. But that's just one way of solving a scheduling problem, right? Yeah. Does Timefold have a specific kind of like solution or a, a solver, or is there many? Yeah. So uh, this is a form of meta-heuristics. So in meta-heuristics, yeah. uh, it's basically an algorithm that works on many types of these problems. And we have a number of these too. So one of them is, for example, we have, we have an implementation of late acceptance, mm, we have an mm -hmm. implementation of taboo search, and we have an implementation of simulated annealing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we, yeah. we would love to have an implementation of generic, genetic algorithms too. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've played with all of these. Uh, we've been in many academic competitions to see which one is best. And we have a, yeah, I, I would argue, production-wise, the best possible algorithm available if you look at the other production solvers. Mm -hmm. um, but there's more to the story, because before we can actually run this, um, any of these meta-heuristics, meta including like the gener generic algorithms, you first need to construct a solution. Right. So we have construction heuristics too. And this is pretty much what people do right now when they have to solve this problem uh, automatically. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they say, for example, when you're assigning shifts to employees, they just pick one of the shifts, they order the shifts, they pick one of the sh shifts and assign it to one of the employees. They pick the next shift, assign it to one of the employees, and they take into account all of the constraints. So when they're assigning the second shift, they make sure they're not assigning if it's for, uh, to the same employee at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there, so, I mean, there's there's like a lot of different meta heuristics. Yeah. Have you found in your experience that, you know, in like generally that some are better than, like better is such a, yeah. it's, it's a very loaded word to use in this case, but yeah. is it that certain heuristics are better for certain applications or for different size of problems or different number of constraints? Like, how do you determine which meta heuristics are best for a given problem? I'm sorry, it's not a really good word to use in this case, but yeah. Well, the, f the f first thing is that the, the choice of the meta heuristic is like 10% of what will what will really result, okay uh, yeah you know result in the quality right you have mm -hmm. other things like incremental score calculation you mm -hmm. have things like do you we call it nearby selection do you use multiple cores and that kind of stuff yeah but the al the algorithm itself is also quite important mm -hmm. and so when you look in the form of meta heuristics the those the three top ones we have like we have like 15 but the mm -hmm. three top ones we have which are uh, taboo search and uh, late acceptance are default of late acceptance by the way and similar annealing, they play around the same quality. They give you, for example, for a vehicle routing problem, they give mm -hmm. you 25% 20, less driving time. Uh, genetic algorithms in the tests I've seen, and your mileage may vary, and it depends very much on your implementation, but the tests I've seen uh, in these academic competitions is typically around 10 to 15% you will get out of those. Mm -hmm. Machine learning can do that these days too, and they will get you like 1%. So they're nowhere near uh, uh, the meta heuristics. Really? Yeah, so it's not, it's not the right, it's like ha hammering in, in a screw, right? Or you have to use the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a planning problem, you want to use a planning solver. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, when you have any of the decision categorization problems that come with machine learning, you, you want to use uh, that kind of technology. Right? That's fascinating. Is there, what, what is the challenge like in like, in taking like uh, a real life problem? So I guess, maybe let me back up. What, what kind of, I guess, uh, clients or users do you see using Timefall? Like, like, I mean, I mean, I guess you mentioned like, obviously like vehicle scheduling, but what kind of other, yeah. pe what, what kind of problems are people trying to solve with yeah. scheduling? Uh, a very common one is indeed uh, field service routing, which is a form of vehicle routing where you say, I need to go install uh, internet with people's home or I need to send people to fix their dishwashers or things like that, right? Mm -hmm. I need to order each uh, three, four, five jobs in a day. Another one is last mile delivery. I need to deliver 100 packages today. Okay, in which order do I do that? That's mm -hmm. typical vehicle routing problems. Mm -hmm. Taxi problem, I need to pick up people from A to B. But then you also have uh, other kinds of problems like shift scheduling, where you, for example, have to schedule doctors or nurses or mm -hmm. security guards to shifts. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure when somebody says, I want to be off on Wednesday afternoons because I want to take care of my grandchildren, that you can say yes. Oh, wow. And, and when you, uh, for example, when you have a couple mm -hmm. and they uh, go to, they, they, you, they want to have their shifts together, so they are free together, mm -hmm. unless they have kids, then they don't want to have their shifts together. So you want to make sure when you give, when you publish a schedule where those two people are involved, that you follow those constraints as much as possible. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a lot of difficulty in abstracting that? Because I feel like so many of these things are very, you know, very human Specific. problems, yeah. and there's a lot of different factors and nuances. And then you want to place that in, you know, I guess, uh, you know, uh, software engineer slash machine understandable constraints. Like, is how how challenging is that with everyday problems? Like. For, like that. For me, people new to the technology, it's it's quite challenging. Mm -hmm. But once you start seeing it, it's it's all the same. It's like 
there's this in 1970, there's this paper from Karp, and he actually proved that all these kinds of problems are the same in mathematically speaking. Mm, okay. Of course, try to explain that to normal <laughs> people on the street, right? But anyway, um, point, be <laughs> yeah. point being, um, what we do is we we define classes, data classes, right? Like mm -hmm. in like yeah. the Kotlin data class, where you say, okay, I have a tomorrow I'll actually be showing a school time table, where we have a data class of a lesson and mm -hmm. a data class of uh, a time slot and a room, right? And we need to assign those lessons to those time slots and those rooms. Mm -hmm. So that's always some domain specific, but with some data classes, you can write those quite easily. Then you need to tell our solver what do you want us to fill in. Can yeah. you, like, for example, pick the time for your lesson, or can you also change teacher? Right. Okay. So certain things you want to change, certain things you don't want to change. Yeah. And then you have to write the constraints, and the constraints are um, um, very functional, like uh, code. Mm -hmm. um, you can write, uh, and uh, you basically just say, okay, when I have, a, a, for example, a not, a two lessons of the same teacher at the same time, I don't want this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we do provide some APIs for that because we want to do something called incremental score calculation, which mm -hmm. means that if we change the solution, like mm -hmm. in generic algorithms, this is yeah. quite powerful to use at the earlier too. Yeah. When you change the solution, that you get to um, that you yeah. calculate the delta between the two solutions right. instead of doing it from scratch. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for for those of you who aren't familiar, genetic algorithms would just like kind of use the idea that oh, when you know, uh, I guess when life forms kind of combine and make offspring that, you know, is, is that a whole idea of like uh, the way that genes kind of mutate as yeah. as you create offspring. So that was the same idea as you kind of mutate to solutions. But as you said, I think with genetic algorithms, if I remember, it's been 20 years, that it's almost a little bit random or just not yeah. uh, deterministic, whereas you're saying that, that there's a little bit more. We, uh, actually, our algorithms have a random C2. So oh, really? OK. Yeah, yeah. So for example, late acceptance will break ties on randomness okay. um, and will select also on randomness. Mm -hmm. But because we use a random seed, even when we do multi-threaded solving and we have to basically figure out the race mm -hmm. conditions and, and concurrency around that. Yeah. We make sure that when we do two runs, mm -hmm. you get the exact same result uh, every time if you give it the amount, same amount of CPU power. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you have a bug somewhere or something weird happens, you can fully reproduce that. If that happens in production, you can fully reproduce that in uh, locally. So if there's a bug in your code oh, or okay. have a from in our code, then it, uh, we can reproduce it. I actually wanted to touch on this because, again, this was 20 years ago. Um, the way that we were experimenting was that we would have, you know, we set up our problem, we'd run a simulation, it would take some time, and then we'd kind of see the results. But yeah. real life isn't like that. And I think I was looking at Timefold and it says you actually do like continue, like you use actually continuous. Yeah. So how does that work? I mean, again, I'm, this has been 20 years, so I'm just like boggled by, you know, the kind of advancements. Like, how does, how does like, I guess, again, and this kind of goes back to the everyday practical usage of like, so it's your system is performant enough that you can actually keep continuously solving scheduling problems, right? Yeah, so we, have, we call this operational fit and it's multiple forms of that. So the simplest one is where you say, okay, let's say you do shift scheduling for a number of nurses in a hospital. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you plan six weeks ahead and every week you plan again six weeks in a half. Okay. So you basically add like a, a shifting planning window, right? Yeah, so yeah. Every six weeks you add one at the, at the end. Yeah, yeah. But um, you plan a little bit longer to make sure that you the, you don't paint yourself in the corner at the end. It's ba basically when you only look just until where you want to publish, um, you mm -hmm. might you might paint yourself in a corner. So you want to uh, schedule an extra week or so, plan mm -hmm. an extra week, but don't publish it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the thing in the middle, we don't replan that unless we um, unless it has to. For example, somebody calls in sick or other kinds oh, of things. Yeah. And 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 that's continuous planning. Yeah. And then we also have real time planning. So in real time planning, that's really in the second. Uh, that's for example, an event comes in and we say, okay, we need a we need a new plan. But instead of recalculating it from scratch, we take the old plan mm -hmm. as a warm start. Mm -hmm. We change the problem. Like for example, this person is a very mall that bus breakdown or whatever the case at air. Mm -hmm. Plane uh, is five minutes late, whatever the case, and we replan the, the thing based upon that. So if you had like a fire drill during a conference that interrupted everything, you could you, you could we account could, for that. Read, yeah. <laughs> you will have a problem getting that published. <laughs> new, new, new schedule. And I'm sure we want to have a non-disruptive version of the schedule mm -hmm. right, with the least amount of changes. But yes, you could do that. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of that, yeah. we have a conference scheduling uh, uh, example, a quick start. So you can go to our 
quick starts right now. Okay. Check it out. And say you, we take the schedule of the conference, we put that in. Mm -hmm. And this is actually being used for some of the conferences. Not sure for Kotlin Conf yet, but I, w I wonder if a lot of the attendees will be inspired now to give give yeah. give Timefold a shot. Just yeah. being in, just having to experience kind of real life disruptions of schedules. But <laughs> this is awesome, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Um, again, I I apologize. I'm also it, it, I, I just have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for scheduling. But obviously, there are so many every like every almost every second of every day, there's a scheduling problem somewhere, and they're very NP hard. Uh, so I think time will be worth looking into. Um, and again, if you enjoyed this, please check out Jeffrey's talk on Timefold and of course check out Timefold itself. Um, if people wanted to find you on the internet, where can they do that? Uh, so you go to timefold.ai on the website, uh, you can click, click on the documentation to find okay. more how to use this and to find me, uh, I'm on Twitter, Jeffrey DeSmet and I'm on LinkedIn and Muscle also. Beautiful. Well, thank okay. you so much Jeffrey for your time. Okay. Uh, and thank yeah, you. and thank you all for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.